Happy uh, 4.10 p.m. slot. Y'all are the, <laughs> the real troopers getting to the end of the conference, so thank you. Um, my name is Isaac Reith. I lead the NoSQL infrastructure team at Bloomberg. <laughs> and with me today is Lindsay Sarovjak. She's an engineer with me on the NoSQL infrastructure team. It's been almost seven years since Cassandra as a service came to Bloomberg. Over that time, we've learned a lot about the many obscure ways that Cassandra can break. In this talk, we'll present a few of the problems we've seen over the years, some of the warning signs that Cassandra has for identifying these issues, and what you can do to both fix the issue in the immediate term, as well as prevent it from happening in the future. Before I talk about all of that, I'm going to talk a little bit about Bloomberg, in case you aren't aware of what Bloomberg is and what we do. So Bloomberg is a technology company that provides financial data primarily through software known as the Bloomberg Terminal. So Bloomberg Terminal has more than 350,000 subscribers and offers different financial analytics tools, which we call functions, to finance professionals around the globe who use the data and news we provide to do their jobs every day. We have over 21,000 employees in 70 countries, more than 8,000 of whom are engineers. Our engineers are active members of the open source community, both as users and contributors. If you've merged my PRs, Stefan's in the audience somewhere, thank you. Um, and we even have people who serve as PMC members as well. Bloomberg has transitioned over the last two decades to becoming an open source first company. We use hundreds of open source projects to power our products and infrastructure. A little bit about the NoSQL infrastructure team. We offer Cassandra as a managed service to engineers at Bloomberg. Our goal is to make it easy for engineers at Bloomberg to use Cassandra to power their applications without needing to understand the complexities of managing a large scale distributed database. We started in 2017 and we've been growing ever since. The scale at which we now operate is around 2.5 petabytes of data served by 3,000 Cassandra nodes broken into 250 clusters. Operating at this scale has presented a number of interesting challenges, and we'll dive into those next through a bit of a role-playing exercise. Lindsay and I will both take the role of engineers doing an on-call shift for the NoSQL infrastructure team. We'll talk a little bit about the problems we see and how we fix them. But as with all uh, based on real life media, we'll preface our story with a disclaimer. The events you're about to witness are fictitious and have been condensed into a single on-call shift for dramatization purposes. No engineers were woken up in the middle of the night in the making of this presentation. So I start my on-call shift, and I get my first issue. I log in to figure out what the issue is and assess the impact. I see that disk usage is getting pretty high in a number of our Cassandra nodes. It's not yet impacting our users, but we need to figure out what's going on before the disks fill up. Looking further at some of the Cassandra metrics for the cluster running on these machines, I see that there's a table with a large number of data files in this cluster. When I look at the droppable tombstone ratio, which defines the ratio of data, which can be cleaned up by Cassandra to live data, it's very high. So I need to ask myself two questions. One, what is deleting the data and thus generating the tombstones? And two, why isn't compaction deleting the tombstones off of disk? So I take a look at the table schema, and I can see that TTL is very clearly what's generating the tombstones. And the table here is compacting data using time window compaction strategy. On the surface, nothing seems to be too strange here. I then ask myself, why isn't time window compaction strategy cleaning things up? Luckily, Cassandra offers a tool called SS Table Expired Blockers to be able to figure that out. So using that tool, I discover the culprit, and I use the SS Table metadata tool to actually inspect the data. One thing that I see on this SS table is that it's mostly expired data. However, the max expiry time, the meta expiry time of the data in this SS table is different. And this is what's preventing the data file from being dropped and in turn letting other tombstones build up. So what's actually causing the expiry times to be different? I look at some application code and I see the culprit. There are some code paths which have a using TTL clause um, adding to the insert statements. In this case, it's using a TTL of two minutes. However, if you remember on the last slide, our default TTL was set to six months. So that means that some of our data is expiring in two minutes, the other data is expiring at six months. And so to explain why this is a problem, I'll go into a small example of how time window compaction strategy works, and we'll be able to illustrate the issue. Well, before we dive into an example, I'll give an overview of time window compaction strategy for those who aren't aware of it. So time window compaction strategy is a compaction strategy whose objective is to create a single data file for a given time window. Data in a given time window will generally be queried together in a time series use case. So having a single data file where all the data for that time window is in the one data file as well as expires at the same time is a really nice optimization we can have. However, once a single SS table is created for a given time window, TVCS won't actually merge it with any other SS tables in that time window. 
and will instead rely on dropping fully expired SS tables as well as tombstone compactions to actually clean up the tombstones. So now that we've talked about that, we'll go to an example. So in our very simplistic example, let's say that we have a time window of one minute, um, and we start with no data on disk. So we first start writing some data, and we generate our first SS table, which we call SS table one. In this SS table, what you'll see is some numbers. Those represent partition keys, and those become important in a minute. We continue writing data, and we flush another SS table, SS table two, and then compaction runs and merges them together in an SS table called SS table three. So now one minute has passed, and we have like a new time window that started. All the SS tables for the old time window have been merged together. We see SS table three. It's actually a pretty nice SS table. All the data in this SS table is expiring within two minutes. They all expire at the same time. So we'll keep writing more data, and we'll create a new SS table, SS table four, and SS table five. This is where we start to run into problems. This data is not nearly as nicely organized. Some of the data in each of these SS tables expires in two minutes, but there is some data that also expires within six months. So compaction will run again and merge them together to a new SS table we call SS table six. So now that two minutes have passed since the original SS table was created, you'll see that it's fully expired. It would be awesome if we could clean up this data. We don't need it anymore. We know we have a TTL, um, you know, expiry immutable data type use case. However, recall that Cassandra will no longer run a compaction to merge it with SS table six because they're part of different time windows. And so instead we need to rely on purging the fully expired SS table. However, to do that, Cassandra will run a check first to see if there are any partitions which overlap with live data before dropping the SS table. And if it does, that SS table won't actually be dropped. And so what you'll see in this case is among other partitions, partition zero and partition one overlap between SS table three and SS table six. Even worse, partition one will expire in six months, which means SS table three is going to be sitting around for a while before we're actually able to clean it up. So this is going to be our first issue, and we'll talk about how you can fix this in a minute. But continuing on, we'll flush two new SS tables, SS table seven and SS table eight, which get compacted again into a new SS table, SS table nine. So now more time has passed since the two minute TTL data was written into SS table six, and that's now expired as well. So SS table six is not fully expired, but it would be really nice if we could run a tombstone compaction to clean things up here. So why isn't Cassandra running that? Well, SS table six <clears throat> will only have a tombstone compaction run on it if, again, there are no overlaps between other live SS tables. Otherwise, the tombstone compaction by default won't run. So what can we do to actually get Cassandra to clean things up here? Well, the first thing that we can try is by setting the unchecked tombstone compaction uh, parameter in your compaction strategy. This will let Cassandra run a tombstone compaction even if the SS table in question that you want to compact has overlaps with other live SS tables. In this case, only the tombstones which do not overlap will be purged, and this could have helped clean up that data in SS table six. However, if unchecked tombstone compaction isn't good enough to clean things up, then we can also set allow unsafe aggressive SS table expiration. This name sounds really scary, and I think it's supposed to be kind of scary because it can end up deleting data that you don't want to be deleted if you don't have a 100% append-only TTL use case. So be very careful when setting this, this argument. You need to set both a JVM option and alter your table's compaction strategy to set it. And this would have allowed us to drop the SS table, um, SS table three from our example. So this would help clean things up in the immediate term, but what could we do maybe longer term to fix the problem? Thinking longer term, if you can change your data model to work better with time window compaction strategy by bucketing different expiry times into their own tables, this can help prevent the issue in the first place. But this is only really possible if you know up front all the different TTLs that you need. We understand that sometimes it isn't always feasible to do. Sometimes you really do need fully dynamic row level TTL to solve whatever problem you need to solve. And so in that case, if you can't break apart your TTLs, don't use time window compaction strategy. We'd probably suggest using leveled compaction strategy um, it's more aggressive, it'll help purge tombstones uh, more aggressively out of these types of use cases. Um, one thing we're really excited for in Apache, or Cassandra 5 is unified compaction strategy. So hopefully we can spend a lot less time thinking about compaction. So after getting the tombstone issue out of control, it's a really busy shift for me. I have another problem I gotta solve. So all of a sudden we're starting to see write timeouts occur on a few nodes in one data center. We're not really sure why this is happening, but these writes seem to always be timing out in the same data center. And they're indicating that three responses have been received in that data center, 
And so what this is indicating to us is really that a cross data center handoff is failing in Cassandra. Looking at the remote data center to where the, we see these timeouts, we see that one node had an out of memory error. But this is really strange, right? Shouldn't the node be down? Like, why is it still getting requests? Why is it still participating in anything? Well, if you use the default JVM option that ship with Cassandra, there's a flag exit on out of memory error that will be set that causes Cassandra exit when an out of memory occurs. However, this flag will only work when an out of memory is a result of a heap space or metaspace exhaustion. And for a native thread out of memory, the process will sit there still running. So you might then be asking yourself, okay, well, if that process is still running, why is it still reporting us up to the rest of the cluster? And this has to do with gossip. So if the gossip threads are still running, it will still be responding to the pings that the other nodes send to it. And so the cluster will actually think that this node is healthy when it actually can't create any new threads. And so why is this causing a timeout? Well, when a cross data center coordinator is chosen for the write, um, the write request will just most of the time be pending. And it won't actually be processed. And because that write request isn't processed, the cross data center coordinator can't forward on to the replicas in that data center. And then from the query coordinator perspective, you're just going to see a timeout. So what can we do in this situation to make sure that we don't have to deal with this problem? Well, first and foremost, you should identify that a native thread out of memory has occurred. And when this happens, you need to jump into action right away and ensure the node that is killed. There are JVM agents like JVM Quake, which can be really good at helping to, uh, to automate this problem. But at the very least, you need to make sure the node comes down. So this will help mitigate the issue in the immediate term. But in the longer term, you need to figure out why you're not able to create new threads on a given machine. A lot of the times at Bloomberg, when we've seen this, it's because there's some sort of configuration on the machine that's wrong, like NPROC isn't set properly, or maybe you're running with system D and you forgot to set the task max parameter. And so one thing to note with this is even though that we found this in Cassandra, it's really a problem that plagues all JVM software. So we definitely recommend taking the learnings that we had from this problem and applying them to kind of all your JVM-based applications. So this has been a pretty busy on-call shift for me, and Lindsay can see that I'm getting pretty tired. So she's going to take it over from here, and I'm going to go get some rest. Enjoy your sleep, Isaac. <laughs> so I've barely been on call, and I'm already getting paged. Let's see what's happening. All of a sudden, an application is seeing sporadic authorization errors. But we haven't made any updates to the authorization policies for this cluster. On the server side, we see that we're under a lot of load, and we see this specific error message about a failure to authorize a user. What's happening under the hood? So in order to figure that out, we have to see how uh, Cassandra does authentication and authorization. Cassandra maintains internal caches of authorization policies, roles, and credentials on each node. And on a cache hit, the request is authorized. However, if a cache entry has reached its expiry or if the policy isn't present in the cache, then Cassandra will perform an internal query to system auth roles and role permissions tables in order to refresh it. So why is the failure happening? These authorization queries get added to the queue with other queries, and therefore, when a node is already overloaded, authorization queries can start to time out as well. So if this auth request fails, there really isn't an exception which can be thrown other than unauthorized exception or authentication exception, depending on which part of the pipeline actually fails. And so when this error gets sent back to the client, it gets sent back as an authorization failure, instead of being categorized as a query timeout, which applications will typically retry. So what can we do about this? Well, these types of exce exceptions will indicate when the exception is a result of a failure to authenticate or authorize, including when these system auth table queries timeout. So we can know that these failures should be retried. So we highly recommend adding retries and error handling to your application for this case if you haven't already. Now, this error isn't always intuitive, so the error message itself is going to have details around the failure so that you know you're hitting this case. And if you're curious about this and you want to understand it more thoroughly, um, Cassandra 15041 has more information. In a maybe a medium-term solution, increasing the validity of the caches with configs such as roles validity in milliseconds, permissions validity in milliseconds, and credentials validity in milliseconds is going to result in fewer cache refreshes, which can uh, further help reduce these failures. And in more of a long-term solution, if you're not on Cassandra 4.1, you want to upgrade so you can use this last feature, um, configure Cassandra to asynchronously refresh this cache. 
um, with their, your roles, cash, active update, permissions, cash, active update, and credentials, cash, active update. But you guys should have these slides so that you can see this later. <laughs> to emphasize how these last two solutions can help, let's revisit this diagram. So when we set the async refresh, these additional system auth queries aren't going to happen at query time. And while the validity and the refresh configs actually both default to the same value of two seconds, a strategy could be to set the async refresh period to a value that's less than the cache validity. So you know you always hit the cache. And also if you were at Mick's talk earlier, I believe he said you could up it to like 30 seconds. So um, there's that too. It's also worth noting that while using async refresh will help avoid this type of error, it doesn't necessarily reduce load on your cluster. So in times of high load, you may still experience the load shedding that causes this problem, and the queries to system auth tables can still time out, but the difference is, is that this error isn't gonna get sent back to the client and cause this confusion. Um, and additionally, you may now be reading from these tables more frequently, depending on the refresh rate that you set, so be conscious about this as well. We get yet another call. It looks like some nodes are under higher load than others, which is causing timeouts. Let's see what's happening. In addition to seeing timeouts, we're also getting alerts that the disk is filling up on some of these nodes within the cluster. And we look at node tool status to help us understand a bit more about the topology. We see that this cluster is very imbalanced. There are some nodes which are gonna be like twice the size of others, right? What, what is causing this? So to figure that out, we need to look at how Cassandra handles data distribution. Cassandra distributes data around the cluster and determines which, which nodes own what data when nodes are initially added to the cluster. So assume these six nodes are in one data center here. This makes up what's called the token ring. Each node is responsible for a subset of data determined by this ring. The partition key, which is defined in your data model, is hashed to determine the first replica where the data is stored. So for example, in the query we see here, the partition key is the name John Doe. The value is hashed to equal the token seven. Now Cassandra uses consistent hashing, so no matter how many nodes we add to this cluster, the partition key is always gonna hash to the same token value. We see that node one is the node responsible for this data because it owns tokens zero through 10. If we assume that we have a replication factor of three, we have two more replicas that are gonna hold this data. Now the replicas are determined by moving clockwise around the ring and selecting the first node that's in a different rack than previously chosen replicas until the replication factor is met. So we see in this example, we now have node two, which is on rack two, and node four, which is on rack three, have been selected as replicas. Now imagine there's a rack with only one machine. This one node is gonna be supporting data that other racks would split between several nodes. So this is gonna become a problem. The issue is even clearer when we see the physical view here. Rack one has only one node in it and no more inventory to add into the cluster. So we'll need to get rack one out of the cluster entirely and add in a few more nodes from a new rack, such as rack zero here, which has more inventory. Now in this cluster example, we have four racks of nodes to choose from, but a replication factor of three. So how can the relationship between replication factor and rack count help us to prevent this in the future? So having a replication factor that's less than the rack count is gonna make it more difficult to tell which nodes are replicas for what data as Cassandra can choose many combinations of racks depending on the token value of the partition key and the token ownership of the nodes in the cluster as we saw before. So one partition might be replicated across nodes in racks one, two, and three, but another partition may be on nodes, racks, in, nodes of racks one, three, and four. So this is gonna result in some imbalance and some racks may end up being responsible for more data than others, depending on the partition strategy. Because remember the partition hash determines where we start in the ring. On the flip side, having a replication factor greater than the rack count will result in placing replicas within the same rack, which Cassandra tries to avoid. This makes your cluster more susceptible to outages as nodes within the same rack could all come down at the same time due to network or cooling issues, and that's gonna result in loss of quorum, which obviously we don't want. So the solution here is to set the number of racks equal to your replication factor by creating a logical grouping of machines. This results in Cassandra placing a replica in each rack and spreading data between the racks. So let's visualize this. We see here now with a replication factor of three and a rack count of three, we know that there's a replica in each rack and the machines within the rack split the ownership of all the data. And since all machines are now part of one of three racks, the same set of machines now results in more usable inventory available for the cluster. 
Now, even though we're no longer bound by the physical location of the machine when adding machines into the cluster, it's still important to remember the physical locations when creating these logical groups, right? When taking this approach, you should ensure that the machines on the same physical rack are part of the same replication group so that no two replicas are, paced, are placed on the same physical rack. And if you're in AWS using the EC2 snitch or the EC2 multi-region snitch, it's important to align the number of availability zones that you deploy in with the replication factor since these snitches are gonna use the availability zone as rack information. So now when all the nodes in the cluster begin to fill up, we can spread the data out more easily by adding more nodes in each rack. It's important to note that this strategy really only works when you enable the config allocate tokens for key space or allocate tokens for replication factor, depending on which Cassandra version you're running. Um, these configs trigger the distribution of tokens more evenly around the cluster, taking into account your replication factor here. So while the strategy as a whole is gonna help you with controlling data distribution around your cluster, it's not gonna solve large partitions. <laughs> um, it's not gonna solve the imbalance of data relating to a bad partition strategy, so still be conscious about that. This is not an out. We made it to the end of our own cost lift. <laughs> so what did we learn? In addition to the solutions of the individual problems that we saw, there are some themes across all of these problems that we need to take note of going forward. First, observability is immensely helpful in identifying issues in Cassandra. There are a lot of metrics available as well as very thorough logging. So make sure to use these in understanding what's going wrong here. In addition to metrics and logs, Cassandra offers great tools such as Node Tool, SS Table Metadata, and SS Table Expired Blockers that help diagnose these cluster issues. Second, configuration is very important. It's really tempting to use the default configs, but there are a lot of opportunities to enhance performance and prevent the types of issues that we talked about, if you're willing to dig a bit deeper. In addition to the official documentation, the ASF JIRA is also very helpful in understanding what these configurations do uh, and documents some of the more esoteric configurations that Cassandra offers. And finally, I cannot stress this enough, be proactive when monitoring your systems. Learn the early warning signs, such as an increasing droppable tombstone ratio, and act when you see them to prevent the fall of your application. Okay, so we're gonna take questions, but while we do that, we're hiring. So if anything that we said today sounds interesting, I promise that's not a typical on-call <laughs> shift. <laughs> um, come talk to us, feel free to scan the QR code. Any questions? Oh, you're going to let us off easy? Thanks. We'll take it. talk about that yeah I'd say in like the extreme so that's like a very real example that we had where we had a single like rack node in a single rack like that in those examples it didn't really help a whole lot and we did need to be able to add inventory in there to spread out the load um, before we went with the strategy of just racks equals replication factor just setting that parameter did help a lot with um, rebalancing your data um, but for exa an example like that it, it you still need to be able to spread out that load a little bit more. Yeah. All right, well, if there's no other questions, I mean, we'll be right over here so you can come ask us questions or you know where to find us. Um, thank you all for making it this far into the conference. Really appreciate you all coming to the talk and uh, Hope you enjoy the rest of your day.